I have a one-year-old at home and so it's definitely every single day thinking all right I can make it this morning and am I going to make it home this afternoon. Tonight at 10 the human cost of a natural disaster. Anytime that the canyon is closed um, that affects our team. I-70 remains closed by mudslides. Patients in crisis are forced to make detours. Doctors and nurses adding extra hours to their commute. CDOT can't say when the road will reopen. This is one of the, the longest closures that we've had of the canyon. Tonight, Denver 7 brings you an in-depth look at the unseen impact of this summer's historic mudslides. Plus, as kids return to school, experts debate the lasting effects of remote learning. We'll show you how to help your child adjust to life in the classroom. And a stunning revelation in the disappearance of Suzanne Morphew. And good evening, and thank you for joining us for Denver 7 News at 10. I'm Ann Trujillo. And I'm Shannon Ogden. The state is committed to reopening I-70 through Glenwood Canyon as soon as possible. As you know, it's been closed by mudslides and debris since July 29th. Well, the governor and other state leaders are now asking for $116 million in emergency highway repair money from the federal government. The plan is to use that money to reopen the highway and then strengthen an alternate route along Cottonwood Pass. Emergency repair crews have not stopped working since the road closed. They have moved more than 1,400 truckloads of debris, and that adds up to as much as 26 million pounds of material, and it still hasn't been enough to reopen I-70. Wow, and Coloradans will tell you I-70 is not your average highway. It is a lifeline for this state. The extended closure is impacting tourism, agriculture, and a lot of industries in between. It's also cut off some communities from their local hospital, a burden for people needing care, and for the doctors and nurses and other hospital staff trying to get there to provide patient care. Denver 7's Ivan Rodriguez reports. Every single day is unknown. Every day Ellie Reichstein leaves for work, she worries about not being able to come home to her family. I have a one-year-old at home, and so it's definitely every single day thinking, all right, I can make it this morning, and am I going to make it home this afternoon? Reichstein is the director of acute and critical care at Valley View Hospital in Glenwood Springs. Her usual drive from Eagle to work takes about 40 minutes. Now... It takes me about an hour and 45 minutes. Um, one way. A similar impact many of her own employees are facing. I have 117 employees that work for me and several of them um, are in the same boat as me. We're living on this side of the canyon and commuting every single day. The closure of I-70 through Glenwood Canyon has impacted more than the hospital staff. It's put patients who need to access critical care in a tricky situation and put a strain on the hospital supply chain. We have vital medical supplies that need to get to the hospital that are required for caring for our patients and our vendor partners are doing all that they can to navigate the detour and uh, to creatively approach how they get supplies to us. Stacy Gavrell says private pilots have also lent a helping hand. Some of the pilots have not only volunteered their time, but their aircraft to fly over some of our frontline health care workers who've had to get to the hospital here in Glenwood Springs for their shifts. A creative way to get through a difficult time. The question is, how long can this be sustained? The point of no return is going to be when the weather comes, right? It's only August now, which is beautiful for us, but Cottonwood Pass is not a road that will be able to be maintained through the winter. For now, the unpredictable Cottonwood Pass serves as a lifeline for many health care workers, while I-70 remains closed through Glenwood Canyon. But the sooner long-term repairs can be made to I-70, the better. It's something that I definitely think about every single day on my commute. A commute that won't get easier anytime soon. Ivan Rodriguez, Denver 7. Mm. And contact Denver 7's hearing from families who paid a lot of money for a mountain vacation and who are now paying again to cancel their plans because of that I-70 closure. Now, Landy Schleter and his wife just moved to Colorado last year and plan to explore Vail and Aspen for the first time this weekend. Well, that road closure made them reconsider. Some reservations were easy to cancel, but not all of them. Aspen Mountain Lodge would not refund their nearly $400 reservation, stating they missed a 10-day cancellation window by three days. I said, I understand that we can read that clearly, but because of the situation, is there anything that they could do to help us with that? And they told us, you know, repeatedly, the manager there told us repeatedly, you can get here. I think people need to know that they need to take a breath and it's Colorado. Any road you take to get here is going to be a phenomenal adventure. So just because you can't come one way, there's three other ways to get here. 
management at the lodge there is recommending several detours for guests. One is more than six hours from Vail. Two others are mountain passes, which, by the way, are not recommended by CDOT. This summer has been unbearably smoky on the Front Range. We've seen 36 straight ozone action alert days. Uh, that's more than we get in some years. And today, Denver's air quality ranked as the worst in North America, fifth worst on the planet. For the last week, Denver has consistently been near the bottom of worldwide rankings. Well, Chief Meteorologist Mike Nelson is calling for a weather action day. As a result, he joins us now with more details on this, Mike. And it's going to get a little better, but not until later tomorrow. This is the air quality across the nation. You see that red, that's the smoke that's coming in from the western forest fires, mostly California, southern Oregon. Now what's going to happen over the next 24 hours? It actually gets a little worse tomorrow than it was today, but by Wednesday conditions will improve a bit, but you still see that streak of smoke coming in. That's the combination of the wildfire smoke, but also we have the ozone, which is invisible, but at low levels along the front range from exhaust gases getting cooked up, if you will, by the hot weather that we've had recently. Tonight, a couple of thunderstorms way out east. I'll talk about that a little bit more later in weather, but today, 98 tied the record high in Denver. It was 100 degrees in Fort Collins today, 104 at Ray. We're still in the upper 70s right now at this hour, and so our weather headlines coming up for the next 24 to 48 hours. More poor air quality expected through tomorrow. Gets a little bit better Wednesday. Avoid strenuous outdoor exercise, even if you don't have any breathing or uh, heart problems. Uh, athletes should not be out there running in this kind of smoky conditions, and you can help by not using gas-powered mowers, trimmers, that type of thing, especially during the heat of the day. It stays hot and dry through the week. We do have some rain in the forecast, the extended. I'll talk about that more in about 10 minutes. Thank you, Mike. Several bombshells today in an eight hour preliminary hearing in Barry Morphew's murder trial. He is charged with killing his wife, Suzanne. We learned there's been no physical evidence found, no blood, no remains, no body. Prosecutors also painted a picture of a tumultuous marriage. They say Suzanne was having an affair for more than a year before she disappeared and that she suspected her husband was having an affair too. The couple we found out also fought about money and text messages indicate Suzanne thought about leaving Barry for more than a year before she disappeared on Mother's Day of 2020. The testimony will continue tomorrow and ultimately a judge will decide if there is enough evidence to move forward with a trial. Thousands of Colorado kids made their return to class today. That includes most of Douglas County, Bennett, and secondary students in the Gilpin School District. Adams 14 starts tomorrow, Brighton 27J, and Weld RE4 on Wednesday. Aurora, Inglewood, Littleton, and several others begin Thursday. Jefferson County will go back next Tuesday, and Denver Public Schools doesn't start until the 23rd. Now this evening, Boulder County announced it will require masks indoors at schools, preschools and child care facilities. This applies to everyone to end up vaccinated or not. The district says it's trying to balance the threat of the Delta variant with the importance of classroom learning. When schools moved to remote learning back in spring of 2020, a lot of districts said things would be back to normal by May. Well, here we are about to start our third school year impacted by COVID. And there's no uniform approach to the pandemic. Every district is handling it differently, creating even more uncertainty for Colorado's exhausted parents. Well, tonight, Denver 7's Russell Haythorn takes a 360 look at what this semester may have in store. As kids across the state enjoy their last few days of summer break, parents, grandparents, and teachers find themselves trying to navigate an uncertain start to the school year yet again. Nobody really wants to wear masks all day. It was kind of sad and it was kind of a tough experience. 31% of parents are reporting that they have seen a decline in their children's mental health since the start of the pandemic. Let's start there. No one wants a repeat of the isolation we all went through last year. The opportunity for kids to go back to school, to be on site, be in person, is really going to be the most valuable experience for them. Even with spiking cases of the Delta variant and new CDC guidance on masks, licensed counselor for kids, Whitney Carney, says we've learned a lot. I think validating feelings, whatever it might be that they're experiencing, is really, really important. And also creating a platform or an opportunity to have those conversations. Carney suggests 
talking to your kids about what's going on in an age-appropriate way. Let them know that there are certain things that, that are unknown at this time. We certainly want to give them information that help reduces that anxiety, but not add more information where it, it contributes to an increased anxiety. I feel great. Dad Matt McQuan is ready to jump back in. From our like personal perspective, we're, we're okay going back. His son, Royal, is in Cherry Creek Schools, where Matt's wife is also a teacher. She was, you know, got vaccinated as soon as as they, they offered it to her in March. Royal adjusted well to last year's changes, but Matt says he's ready for more normalcy. He did pretty well. I mean, not, you know, all kids his age might struggle a little bit, but yeah. he did better than I thought he would. I think initially it was really tough and hard. Jen Shuda is a nanny and a ski instructor who says some kids are just now coming out of their COVID-induced shells. One little girl I watch, she's definitely like transitioning to being like social again. Shuda says it would be really hard to go back to masks and lockdowns. Also, I think just to be part of the movement of like, hey, let's get over this and move forward. She's hoping ski season looks better too. Yep, get back in the groups. Like I said, you learn off each other. Some of them learn better um, with other kids. Um, it also gives them a little sense of community too. Absolutely. Grandfather Phil Maynard agrees. I think it's part of the social development so integral to the education I think is the experience of different kids different behaviors but he's also realistic about the possibility of masks to start the school year for kids because they are without the benefit of vaccines I think that makes it a lot more difficult of a choice so the value of the masks increase and that brings us back to Carney and whether we should or shouldn't mask up for this school year. There's certainly an advantage of being able to have those nonverbal gestures from the face that allow for an increased connection with others. So there's certainly an added benefit to that, but then we have to weigh, you know, the safety concerns with that as well. Another difficult start to the year as families try to navigate the lingering pandemic and what's best for our kids. We do know that they have a strong sense of resiliency. Russell Haythorn, Denver 7. I just can't believe it's like a different style. A father wanted to introduce his son to Colorado, but their stay was extended and the family's custom camper was stolen. I'm just really happy that we're all safe. Tonight, Denver 7 is rallying support for a family who saw the wrong side of Colorado. Plenty of haze and smoke continue in our skies through tomorrow. Maybe a little break later this week. And some of Boulder's youngest all-stars have their eye on a national championship.